I don't know about you guys, but my garden is insane this year. Uh, this is my heat loving garden. This is my summer garden here in the Philadelphia area. Today is June 9th. And my corn on June 9th is insane because if you guys follow me on Instagram or Facebook, we did a couple follow up posts on my corn. Uh, we did a video originally around May 15th for anybody that's interested. We did a May 15th video talking about how I planted out the corn. And then on around June 15th, 10 days later, I showed you guys what the corn looked like and it was insane. And then I showed you guys what the corn looked like on June 30th. And I was in the photo and the corn was up to my chest about right here. Um, and I said, you know what? That's interesting because corn, they say, should be knee high by July. And that obviously depends on where you guys live, right? But it was, it was amazing to me at least because I failed for a number of years at growing corn. But here, this year, it's insane. Um, 10 days later, after I had posed with the corn, it's now well over my head. It's probably seven, approaching eight feet tall. Uh, it's sending out the male pollen at the top and then below i actually have the first ears of corn that are forming along the stalks and i i might get this is a variety here called silver queen it can produce either one to two ears of corn per stalk so i may get myself two on some of these really big plants uh, and this is what i want this is exactly what i wanted to do in that video we talked about uh, was that we're going to plant ourselves Silver Queen. We're going to go with the standard heirloom varieties. We're going to feed them. We're going to water them a couple times. And we're going to finally succeed at growing corn because for years I had not. We also had to come in here and stake these guys up, which I'll show you guys as we pass through here. The stakes because they actually, there's a gap right here. If you can see this gap is that we had two plants that were quite big. They probably would have been up to here. Um, and they snapped. They were probably my most vigorous growers at the time. And the wind at a certain time of the year, at a certain time of their life cycle, if they're growing very quickly like mine were, and they should be, then they can snap on their own. And it's not like an insect or um, I came out here or a critter came out here and snapped them. It has nothing to do with that. Um, it really is just the wind and how fast they're growing. So I staked them up. You could probably, could probably make that out on the video. I'll zoom in a little bit. Yeah, you can see those stakes down there at the bottom. So I've sort of enabled them with the, a lot of food that I've been giving them. I did a little bit of organic fertilizer in the beginning of the year in the soil. Um, I gave them one shot of liquid fertilizer at the so in the soil, and then I've been feeding them a, fol uh, a foliar spray of Dynagro Protect and the Foliage Pro from Dynagro. And I've been doing that a number of times, and they look ridiculously good. Um, so anybody in the Philadelphia area who's got corn like this, uh, let me know, because then we can, be we can become friends. <laughs> Um, here we have some potatoes and by the way, excuse the very frightening scarecrow. Uh, <laughs> we finally put up our scarecrow because the cat birds are getting to the peaches that are not ripe just yet. They're getting to the unripe peaches on my Espaillat peaches, but we do have the potatoes and I've already harvested a couple of potatoes because you can harvest them on most varieties, when they start to flower, you can get yourself some smaller uh, potatoes that have not necessarily formed a harder skin just yet. They're very good like that. Very good to eat. Um, however, I've just decided to let most of them go. They're dying back, uh, which is when they're finally died back for the most part, you can come in here and do a harvest. What we did in the spring is that we piled on the straw. And this straw has really made it so that these potatoes are a bit cooler. The soil temperatures are a bit cooler, which is how the potato likes to grow in cooler soil temperatures. 
Uh, it also shades the potatoes from the sun, keeping them from getting green and getting that uh, chemical that's a bit toxic to our, our stomachs. Um, also, it was a form of hilling, the straw. I did two applications, one in the beginning. We put down our compost. We put the potatoes in the compost. Then we put down a, a thick layer of straw. Then the plants grew through the straw, put another layer of straw over top. I'm excited for the harvest that should come probably at the end of this month, probably at the end of July. Most of these plants will start to really look very sad and start to die back. Now that was my plan here, uh, was that we have some melons within the corn. As you'll see, here's a really nice patty pan squash plant that if you guys look underneath, we have tons of patty pan squash that are forming. Tons of flowers. I've already gotten myself pretty decent harvest off of these plants. I'm afraid, very afraid of the cucumber beetle um, because we have so many melons underneath these corn plants as we're doing like a, a three sisters style of growing these vegetables this year. So you got the corn obviously at the top. Below you plant your squash and your melons. I have watermelons in here. I have musk melons in here. And then you put your beans in as the plants, the corn gets to a certain height. And the beans are now starting to grow up the corn. They are climbing beans. It's called the Hidatsa shield bean. You guys can find that out. Uh, a lot of seed companies carry it. It's a shelling bean. I'll grow up the plants and get myself enough uh, beans that I can shell and have them all winter if I want. Um, so it's a nice little three sisters garden here I got going. Um, so far it's working out. I've really been impressed. I've always wanted to do something like this. The melons are now, obviously they've been flowering for quite some time. The foliage is insane. They're growing every which way you can think of. But what my plan is, is once the, the potatoes kind of die out um, and I start doing my harvest about a couple weeks from now, we're going to send all the, the growth of these melons and these watermelons because they take up so much space. We're going to send them all in this direction towards the potatoes. And then that way they can really take over that space and it's not going to completely take over my, my garden here. So we're all just sending all the shoots. You can see here's one right here. It's getting a little bit out of control, but we're just sending them all in this direction. And that way they're kind of then being focused towards where the potatoes are. And we'll have ourselves a really successful, hopefully a successful garden this year. Assuming I don't get any cucumber beetles with Fusarium wilt. That's the big issue with those. Now we've also got our tomatoes are looking ridiculous. Um, I'll tell you the Dynagro Protect, the Foliage Pro, makes a huge difference with these plants. Um, I planted my tomatoes, my eggplants, my peppers, even my ground cherries here from seed. I direct seeded them into this raised bed. It's only June, uh, July 9th, guys. How do my plants look like this? They all have flowers or fruits on them. The peppers have fruits on them. The eggplants, I've already got a harvest of an eggplant off of this. My ground cherries are looking brilliant. They're gonna start, they've got their little lanterns forming here. They're gonna have ripe fruit soon. My basil looks good, also from direct seed. And then my tomatoes from direct seed are filled with tomatoes, absolutely filled to the brims with tomatoes and they're growing quite well. Um, so how was I able to do this? Well, really simply, we have ourselves a little bit of a, a PVC pole here and I was able to actually uh, start the seeds underneath plastic combined with the fact that I have a raised bed and this is our southern exposure here. It gets a lot of sun, it's a lot of heat during the day. This area really warmed up. I planted my seeds under plastic, so under a low tunnel, um, around May 1st. And now it's June 9th. I already have my first harvest of tomatoes. I had a volunteer tomato of Sun Gold on the other side of the yard. 
that was ripe today. I have some volunteer tomatoes actually in this raised bed right here that we're just gonna let them grow. But among these plants here that we direct seeded, they're really not that far away. I have some black cherry tomatoes as the cherry tomatoes usually are the first of the bunch to ripen. I have some black cherry tomatoes that are very close to being ripe back here. Uh, let me see, actually, one of them is turning color right now. So that's a really great sign. Uh, we have some black ze or green zebra in here. I also have the orange banana tomato, which is a wonderful, wonderful tomato. Um, specifically for making sauce, it's an orange tomato that makes incredible paste or sauce, gravy, whatever you guys want to call it. And then on the end is my pink brandy wines, and they are so productive this year. Uh, wow, I'm just shocked. And I think, to be honest with you, I'm a much bigger fan of direct seeding now than ever. Because normally I start these plants, we just had a little bit of some error this year with our indoor seed starting. But you know, all's not lost, right? You guys maybe make a few mistakes, just make some adjustments. Come in here, guys, and make the right and smart adjustment. You guys will have a successful season. So um, it's not necessarily like you can just give up and say, oh, forget about it. I'm not going to get any fruit. But, you know, even from seed, I'm getting good results here under the right conditions, right? Of course, you got to have a raised bed. Of course, you got to have them in the right microclimate. This is a very warm microclimate in my yard. Normally I would not expect this, these results and I haven't seen these results from direct seeding. I've direct seeded some Jimmy Nardello seeds before. This is what that is, my Jimmy Nardello peppers. And the Jimmy Nardellos will seed, they will fruit for you guys from seed that year in the Philadelphia area, but they don't look nearly as good as these. These are covered in flowers, covered in fruits now. There's actually one down there. That's really quite far ahead. We harvested our first eggplant down there. And you can tell there's all these flowers, all these fruits forming. There's another eggplant. I'm gonna bring you guys in here and show you some of these amazing fruits. Here we have the ground cherries. They're so vigorous. I planted a number of plants in here and I've been thinning them out because it doesn't seem like I really need this many ground cherry plants. It seems like one or two plants would fill this, this about a two by two foot square area and I'd be fine with just two plants. And then the tomatoes guys, just, uh, it's, it's crazy back in here. It's absolutely crazy. Look at that cluster of pink brandywine tomatoes. Um, and they, they form, it seems like, they form because I've been so surprised. They've been forming their clusters of fruits earlier than they would if I transplanted them in. So it seems like uh, you do a comparison between the two and you just get fruit that ripens relatively at the same time. I was quite surprised because normally by mid-July is when I can start expecting my tomatoes to ripen here. That's when I'll start to see the first. Here's some more pink brandy wine. Um, I've got them spaced really close. A foot, each plant gets a foot, a square foot. One square foot, sorry guys. You can see more down in there. It's just insane, guys. Every plant is loaded with tomatoes. They're everywhere. And this is just the beginning. What they do is, because they are basically plants that I'm growing as a single stem, and I've spaced them so close, each individual plant gets their own pole. The poles are spaced to give them one square foot, right? So. Each plant grows up the pole. I trim off the suckers. I trim out the lower growth. 
to give them some more airflow, I need to come in here and actually do that again, is actually trim out some of that lower growth, thin them out a little bit because they are a bit close this year. I haven't seen any disease really for the most part just yet. I've seen some blossom end rot, uh, but I think that's more about the soil and about the variety than, uh, than the lack of airflow in there, but I'm sure that is contributing in some manner. But it's just a wonderful way to grow them because they're gonna grow up the poles. They're gonna get to a height in which I can finally reach them, about eight feet. And then they're gonna cascade down and branch out. And I'm gonna have tomatoes not just starting mid-July or even today, because I had my first sun gold today from Volunteer, but they're gonna produce for me all throughout the rest of the season, all the way until frost. They do not stop. And the reason for that is because they're so indeterminate in how they grow and they cascade down, they're just gonna keep producing. They're gonna keep flowering, they're gonna keep growing, they're gonna keep ripening those fruits. I'm gonna have ripe tomatoes, ripe big pink brandywine beefsteak tomatoes until November 1st. So it's, uh, it's really quite something. I really like this method of growing them. I'm probably going to just do this direct seeding method every year now. No more fiddling with seeds indoors. I guess I could, if I really wanted to get even an earlier harvest, is start them indoors and then put them on the low tunnels. And I would see probably even better results than I did. But assuming you weren't using any low tunnel uh, compared to like last year, I guess that's really the, the fair comparison is having them uh, compared to last year to this year, we managed to figure out a way to get them probably just as early, if not earlier, and more productive than last year. But that is assuming you have some plastic, I think. And then, of course, the melons. We have different types of musk melon and, uh, and watermelon under here that are just doing phenomenally well. And no signs of cucumber beetle just yet, so crossing my fingers for that. We may have our first, one of our first melons setting there. But overall, guys, I'm it's extremely, extremely impressed. Here's the uh, male flowers, the male pollen forming on these corn plants. So yeah, guys, it's amazing how much food I can grow in this little small of a space, too. This is uh, really not that much space. I think it's about 16, maybe uh, 20 feet long by 10 feet wide. So in that amount of space, look how much food I was able to grow. That's incredible. Yeah, 10 by 20. So if you guys enjoyed this one, please let me know. Comment down below. I'm going to keep you guys updated on this garden as we go. Some of you guys think all I do is grow figs, but... Uh, this is one incredible summer garden here. I'm really happy to show this one off. Talk more about this, uh, more about the techniques, the harvest that we're gonna have. So stay tuned, guys. Um, we'll see everybody soon. Check out our blog, figboss.com. Say goodbye to Ginzi. Take care.